Log on, tune in, find out. Another good idea from Cambridge. So I'm going to talk about big visions this evening. Um, and really, when Shai gave me this subject, I, I wasn't quite sure where to start. Um, but we'll, we'll see what I've come up with and see if it hits, hits the, the, the necessary marks. And uh, I'm sure there'll be some, some discussion and questions afterwards anyway. Um, now, actually, uh, I was not involved at the start of ARM. Uh, I joined ARM after ARM had been in existence for, uh, for nearly four years. Uh, we're now about 20, so I have been involved with quite a lot of ARM, and, and certainly uh, uh, after, after four years, uh, it still had a lot of the elements of uh, the, the classic startup. Talking about big visions, actually, <coughs> the words here date back to 1975. Uh, these are some lyrics from Pink Floyd. So uh, appropriate for a uh, Cambridge company and a Cambridge talk. Uh, I guess these words were probably written just up the road. Um, <clears throat> but uh, when, I was talking about, when I was thinking about visions, uh, what, one of the purposes in business that we use visions today uh, is to really enable the, those people within the business uh, to, uh, to align and uh, be part of a team. And so the image that came in my mind uh, was um, pulling together uh, as a team. And um, that, that's where this, this starts. So if you take away one thing this evening, then uh, the purpose of visions in business is about aligning, aligning the team. Um, I'll start off with a quick disclaimer uh, who I am, and then introduce ARM for those who, who are uh, less familiar with ARM. Then we'll talk a bit about visions. Um, talk about missions as well, even though the subject title is, is vision, I want to talk about missions too. Uh, and then uh, a few other important points that about you know, how visions don't really mean much unless you actually get on and execute, uh, and quite a lot of it's about execution. Uh, and then we'll, we'll take some conclusions from that. Um, so first of all, the disclaimer, you know, I am not a business guru, uh, I am uh, an engineer. Um, by background, and I've worked in semiconductors for uh, as long as I've been working almost. Uh, I did do a little bit of management training once upon a time uh, with an MBA, and um, so, so these, what, what I'm telling you about visions, you have to take with a bit of a pinch of salt. This is you know, the words of an engineer. I've done some commercial stuff, uh, and as Shai said, I've been uh, running ARM for quite a while now. Um, do a little bit of external stuff as well to see some other businesses. Uh, and um, as far as I'm concerned, business is part of life. Uh, business is not the whole of life. Uh, life's about playing hard as well as working hard. And uh, for me, friends and family are quite important. So um, that's where you're getting uh, vision from this evening. Now, example business, ARM. Some of you uh, will, have, will have heard of ARM, um, but even in Cambridge, uh, I find that some people who've heard of ARM are less familiar with what we actually do uh, and how we actually do it. And in order to use ARM as an example in talking about visions, it's necessary to do a little bit of introduction uh, on, on ARM just now. So, um, and, and there are a few key words to, to, to remember as we go along. But ARM is about silicon chips. So we've got a board, a board of electronics there. And uh, the, the ARM chip is a large chip on the board. It tends to be, in most products, the, uh, the, the center of the product. Uh, and the key words for you to take away here are chips, silicon chips, and semiconductors. That's what ARM's involved in. Uh, if you look at where you're going to find some ARM technology today, then look in virtually uh, any digital electronic product or lots and lots of digital electronic products that you see in Curry's and Dixon's and uh, places like that. Uh, and if you look inside the electronic product, look, you'll see typically uh, an ARM chip with lots of the functionality integrated into a single chip. Uh, and then within the ARM chip, you'll find a processor, another key word to remember uh, for, for this evening's discussion, a processor, otherwise known as a microprocessor. Uh, and if you like, that's the brain of the chip and the brain of the electronic product. Uh, ARM also provides 
other uh, technology to companies who are building silicon chips and software development tools to allow people to write software for this uh, ARM microprocessor to bring the products to life and make them do things. Um, ARM also relies on a huge network of many other technology companies, all doing little pieces of the jigsaw that go together to make up uh, the electronic products. And to that end, I suppose we are um, slightly a virtual chip company because we don't do the whole uh, we don't do the whole thing uh, ourselves. So where is ARM today? What does ARM look like today? We're, we're 25 years old technology. Um, uh, obviously, the technology is continually being updated, and we have, uh, have many products in the portfolio today. But the fundamental technology is 25 years old uh, from Acorn, Cambridge company. Uh, and um, we're 20 years old as a separate business. But today, we are, have the, 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 leading, um, the leading microprocessor architecture in digital electronic products. And our business is about designing microprocessors and other chip components and licensing that to semiconductor companies. Uh, and this is a fairly fundamental part of the ARM story, so some more key words here. Um, we, we, we sell licenses uh, and we get paid when our licensees are successful and when they ship lots of semiconductor devices to their customers, uh, we earn a small royalty, if you like, a tax on the chip. Uh, so, um, so ARM's revenue is a lot smaller than the ARM chip revenue. Typically, it's about 1% of the total ARM uh, chip revenue. So ARM is actually physically a very small company uh, with a very big reach because with only 1,700 people and 30-odd locations around the world and only half a billion dollars of revenue, there are 4 billion ARM chips shipped uh, per year. Uh, and we estimate that's about two and a half billion electronic products per year uh, and one and a half billion people like you and me that go out and buy them every year. Uh, and that, that gearing, that, that leverage comes from the, uh, the license and royalty business model. So that's, uh, that's our example company for, for the evening. So now we'll talk about vision and mission, and I'm going to start with uh, the, it, some examples from, from ARM. So today, if, you're, uh, if you come along to an ARM corporate pitch, then uh, you'll probably be shown a slide a bit like this outlining our vision. And the words at the top of the slide there uh, are really quite important, and I have on previous occasions gone to try and highlight uh, the different key words, but actually they're all fairly key words. Uh, and from a, a sort of construction of a vision point of view, well, it's a world, so it's a big vision. I'm not talking about supplying electronic products in Cambridge. This is the, the world. Um, and we're all electronic products, so there's no point in compromising here. We're looking for a, a vision which will stretch for a long time. Um, uh, to, to be really successful, we need to put our technology in all electronic products. Products and services, because uh, actually people deliver services on top of electronic products today. Um, you know, if you go and go on uh, an internet-enabled device, connect to the internet, you can you can access a service there. Sometimes there's a payment. Sometimes that payment could be relying on on ARM technology, for instance. Um, another key word is based upon. Right? ARM is not in the business of supplying electronic products or supplying the chips. We're interested in supplying the technology upon which all this is based. Uh, and that's back to the, uh, the, the license and royalty model. It's about partnership. It's about sharing risk and return uh, with our customers. Um, and that's still there in, uh, in, in the vision. The type of technology we're interested in providing, we will narrow it down a bit at this point. And we'll say we're interested in providing energy efficient technology. Uh, and um, being nice people, we're interested in making the world, using that technology to make the world uh, a better place. So if we look at uh, the construction uh, of this vision, it has some scale. Uh, it uh, talks about how we want to see the world uh, in future and how we want to see the world change. Uh, and it's fairly clear uh, for, um, for people to, to understand uh, 
what we're about. However, if you then think, well, okay, uh, where do we start? Well, it's quite big, and therefore it's quite hard to work out exactly where to start. So, mission. Um, mission, if you like, is something a little bit more tangible than the vision. Uh, and I said a few moments ago, and look at ARM and look at our technology and what we're about. We're about providing microprocessors or, or processors. And so the mission that we're about at the moment in terms of realizing that vision I had uh, on the slide a moment ago is, uh, is simply to be the most significant processor architecture. Uh, and to be the most significant processor architecture in the world is implied. It's just the most significant microprocessor architecture. Uh, and most significant can be measured in a variety of ways. It can be measured in you know, the, the microprocessors that ship in the highest volume, the microprocessors that generate the highest value, uh, the biggest number of customers, etc. It's just the most significant. Uh, and um, the, the, I'm using the, the key word that we learned a few moments ago um, about processes. So those are examples of ARM's vision uh, and ARM's mission. And let's think about, um, perhaps more, more generally, a vision will define as a glimpse of what the future might be. Typically, in business, you're not interested in glimpsing what the future might be tomorrow. It'd be very nice to know what's going to happen tomorrow. But um, if we're going to build a long-term sustainable business, it needs to be long-term. Uh, and in business, it's very interesting to have a glimpse of what the future might be where the future has nothing to do with us. But it's more useful to think about how we might change the future and how we want to shape the future as a result of our efforts. And then it turns into something that the organization and the group uh, can, can really align around. Um, but this vision, there's no right answer to the vision for a business or an organization or any, any collection. It can be expressed in a variety of different ways. And lots of people uh, will have different ways of expressing uh, that, that vision. So. Um, it's, it's a bit like when, when you look at any object, different people can see different things in the object. Same with this, this glimpse of the future. The mission is much more tangible. It's about it's what we're about today. It's, it's the, why we get up in the morning and, and what we're actually doing. Uh, and it generates a lot more passion and energy, uh, and there's a lot less scope for ambiguity. Once again, it's something around which you can align an organization or group of people. Uh, and the interesting thing is that you know, within, uh, within uh, an organization of, of reasonable size, then you can have different parts of the organization with a mission. Uh, uh, and that mission for some is a vision for others. Um, a example, um, years ago, I was involved in designing a phone chip. And um, you know, for me, the, the phone chip and having that, that my phone chip deployed in as many phones as I could possibly imagine uh, was, for me, a vision. Uh, for the people who were designing the, the phones around the chip, it was probably you know, their mission to design their phones and, and sell them. For my boss, it was just an objective. And while we're on definitions of objectives and, and that sort of thing, then there are a few others as well. Objectives are like staging posts on the way to the vision. Goals uh, are, are sort of more measurable things that, that are much more short term and, and we can measure. And when people ask, what about a strategy? Uh, well, a strategy is, if you like, the glimpse of the future, but the plan in order to get to the future. And so it's a mixture of the vision and the mission and the objectives and the goals all strung together in a coherent plan to, to uh, achieve that vision uh, out in future. So um, what about ARM's early vision and uh, how has that really helped us over the years? Well, aside from the very, very early um, mission of survival, then ARM's early vision was all about being a standard. and. RISC is another key word here, a type of microprocessor. Uh, for, for those of you not familiar, just it's a type of microprocessor. And we set out to be um, the, 
the standard in that particular type of microprocessor uh, with a bit of definition of market that we were, we were aiming at. Uh, and because of the licensing and royalty mechanism for acquiring revenue, um, there's clearly a shared risk and return with our customers, uh, and so that's, that's, that's real partnership. Um, and so bearing those things in mind, how, how would that early vision have helped ARM um, uh, early on? Well, certainly it did help in, uh, in steering the product strategy. It's very easy in a startup to just satisfy your customers and do exactly what your customers want and allow your customers to bully you uh, into essentially being a cheap service for them. Uh, and that's what, what can, lead to, uh, can lead to failure. I think remembering the vision that's out there, that we're actually trying to be a standard for everybody, uh, helped ARM um, not go down the rat hole, if you like, of, um, of being a slave to a, to a handful of customers. Obviously, customers pay the bills, and so there's a balance and a trade-off here uh, between satisfying your customer and sticking to your vision. Um, it also helped us make decisions about which the, the market definitions up there helped us make decisions about where to focus. And again, in startup mode, when you're very keen on, on getting revenue by any means, it's very easy to try and, if not satisfy just one customer, satisfy everybody. Uh, and small companies don't have the resource to satisfy everybody. Big companies don't have the resource to satisfy everybody. And so some form of uh, assistance with focusing on what you really need to focus on certainly helps. And that allows you to ride through um, products which perhaps have been, uh, have been less successful. Anyway, at this point, I'll change gear. And we've talked enough about, about examples of ARM. Let's have a look at some other uh, examples, perhaps outside the business context. Here's an interesting chap, uh, another, another sort of Cambridge-focused individual, um, very bright guy. Um, and, and of course, Newton is best known for uh, his, his work on, on gravity, laws of motion, optics. Uh, he's less well known for his work on alchemy and the occult, uh, but he actually spent a lot of time on, uh, on the latter two as well. And actually, they helped him. He did have a vision uh, of a common set of rules governing nature. Newton was very much a sole operator. He had some competition, uh, and he had some bitter enemies. In fact, he had a fierce battle uh, with, uh, with Leibniz over you know, who invented differential calculus. Uh, and um, scholars are still arguing about that today, but it's generally attributed to both of them. Um, uh, and in spite of that, he, uh, he, he persevered. He had lots and lots of setbacks, um, lots of opposition. Uh, he even blinded himself at one stage when he was, uh, when he was fiddling around with, with uh, prisms and telescopes. So a lot of things went wrong for him, but he kept at it. Uh, and it took him a long time to come up with his, with his works. In fact, from when he sort of really started on uh, his best-known work, Mathematica Principia, uh, it took him about 20 years. Uh, and he did another version of that, and that took him a further 26 years. So um, these things can take quite a long time. And in all of that, he was a bit of a dreamer, because as I say, he spent a lot of time worrying about the occult uh, as well. Another example. This guy's a little bit different, less of a sole operator. This is William Wilberforce. Uh, William Wilberforce was, uh, was well known for uh, pioneering the abolition of the slave trade in Britain and, uh, and instrumental in removing slavery uh, elsewhere in the world. His vision was pretty clear. He had a vision of a change for the better. He was a wealthy chap. Newton was quite poor. Uh, in, in upbringing. Wilberforce was wealthy uh, in upbringing uh, and had a bit of a conscience, conscience about that uh, and also was a deeply religious chap and so had a vision for changing the better. He, on, rather than being a sole individual, was very much the team player and the team leader. In fact, he was, he was brought in to uh, lead uh, the movement by others who were very committed uh, to um, to abolishing the slave trade. But they faced tremendous opposition and setbacks as well. William Wilberforce was a politician, and his good friend William Pitt at the time had lots and lots of other priorities, like fighting the French. 
uh, and um, dealing with a budget deficit and all those sorts of things that prime ministers have to deal with. Uh, and um, really abolishing the slave trade came a little bit lower down William Pitt's order of um, priorities. So poor old William Wilberforce um, had a lot of opposition, a lot of setbacks, and of course a lot of people had huge vested interests in the slave trade and slavery, and so they, he was pretty unpopular. This guy was a pragmatist, however, and sought to realize his vision in stages. These numbers, I didn't realize, were exactly the same as Newton's numbers until I put these two slides side by side. It is a coincidence uh, that stage one for William Wilberforce was 20 years and stage two was a further 26 years as well. The point is, it took them both a long time. Uh, and I could go on um, because we've, we've looked at a sole individual, we've looked at somebody who, who galvanizes a team. This chap galvanized a whole society um, a little bit later. Um, Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, we all know he was um, instrumental in, uh, in dealing with civil rights in America and improving the civil rights of uh, different races in America. Um, this chap was a teenager when Gandhi was looking for Indian independence in, uh, in the 40s. So he was, an inspired, he was inspired by a role model. And he too had a vision of a better world. And he mobilized literally thousands of people there was huge opposition in his case. And the other interesting thing that comes in his case is, inspired by Gandhi, Martin Luther King was all about non-violent protest. And there were many people within his own camp who actually disagreed with him. So this chap had to cope with uh, setbacks, not just from outside the people that didn't want him to succeed, but people within the camp who wanted him to succeed in a different way. Um, and uh, as far as, as his crusade was concerned, actually, he was assassinated uh, on the way. Um, and others had to take over after his assassination. And again, the whole process was a, was a sort of multi-decade event. And if we go bigger than individuals and bigger than uh, groups and bigger than societies, then nations have visions too. This is Apollo 11 setting off. America to, be, to put the first man on, on the moon. Uh, and was that really um, a, a vision for a nation? Well, I would actually argue that that was probably more of a mission. Uh, and the vision that uh, the Americans had was probably more that communism is a bad thing and Western democracy is a good thing. Uh, and it took the Americans a fair while because um, you know, Apollo 11 was 1969, that particular mission, uh, and the vision and the, with the collapse of the Berlin Wall was actually happening uh, in 1989, so, uh, so 20 years later. Um, interesting, these things all seem to take uh, a very long time. Um, the other point that this example raises, though, is what happens when the vision runs out? What has America done over the last 20 years since 1989? Uh, and has, has that nation been as, as focused and guided as it was uh, in the 20, 30, 40 years before 1989, uh, when the vision was really about deploying Western democracy everywhere. So I think in all these examples, uh, we can make a few observations about vision uh, and what successful visions seem to involve. Um, they do seem to involve a change in how things are happening. Um, generally, there's a group of people uh, involved, often many, sometimes thousands, uh, and they're aligned and the people are very passionate about making the change. The changes are complex and um, therefore not everybody does exactly the same job, uh, but everybody even with different jobs has an eye on that, has an eye on that vision. There's usually tremendous opposition uh, which in a business context you could call competition. Um, sometimes that opposition comes from people with actually a similar vision. You know, arguably, um, you know, Western democracy and communism, you know, there, there are differences, but you know, uh, both, both systems came from people with, with very laudable uh, intentions. Um, motivation is very high. Uh, within the group of people who are uh, inspired by the vision. Um, sometimes it's so high that they will become, you know, in, in some of the political examples we look at, you know, they'll, uh, the, 
people will, will sacrifice themselves. In, uh, in some of the other examples, um, we, we looked at you know, people like Newton slaved away for years uh, on, on his own. Um, so motivation's high. Motivation's high amongst the opposition or the competition. Um, I think there's a theme that's run through all those examples about how long it takes. And that applies to business as well. When you look at um, really great companies with long-lasting brands uh, that have been around for multi-decades, it takes them time to, uh, to realize their, their visions. Um, generally, you find the leaders of um, these, these groups, these organizations, are heavily involved personally in, uh, in driving towards that vision. In fact, the vision itself, when you look back with a sort of historical perspective, is often completely personified. You know? So Martin Luther King, civil rights movement, you know, that the two are, are related. Um, however, sometimes these things take so long that the leadership does change. Um, and uh, the other point probably to note a little bit from that, that last example is that the vision needs to be stretched because once the vision runs out, then uh, the fire is gone from, uh, from the organization and uh, somehow, um, somehow the, the dream is halted. So that's observations about, uh, about vision. Um, now if I come back to my example of ARM and look at the evolution of ARM's vision, because the vision that I put up as the example at the start um, is not the one that, that we had in the early days. The early days, it was all about global risk standard at uh, the intersection of computing, communication, and consumer. Uh, and uh, today's vision, about a world where all electronic products and services uh, are based on power efficient technology from ARM to make the world a better place. That's about totally ubiquitous, energy efficient uh, ARM technology. These are quite different, so why? Um, well, the global risk standard, risk I said was a type of processor. Uh, clearly, there are other types of processor out there, and just risk processors is a bit restrictive. Uh, and so, after a while, in ARM's case, the global risk standard, we sort of tick did that, equivalent to the Berlin Wall coming down. Uh, and we needed to, in advance of that happening, actually, think about where we were going to take the vision after, after that had been achieved. Uh, and so, um, around about the time that that was being achieved, uh, we coined a slightly different phrase, the architecture for the digital world. Uh, and that really was an incredibly geeky thing to come up with, um, because microprocessor people talk about microprocessor architecture. Uh, and so, it was still quite concentrated around microprocessors. and. Um, in order to try and stretch it, we came up with all sorts of um, notions that actually it meant more than just the microprocessor architecture, but the, sort of the, the, the architecture of the, the, the whole chip uh, and so on. And we ended up with actually multi-page descriptions of what the architecture for the digital world actually meant uh, in order to, to get this point across to ARM employees. Um, probably not arm's finest hour, really, that, um, it, it, trying, to, trying to explain the architecture for the digital world. In fact, I still get junk mail from construction magazines that think we're so into architecture, we're a kind of building company. Um, however, we've retained that uh, as a tagline, because when you do know what it means, then, uh, then it is quite quite useful, and um, it's part of the ARM brand. But I think there were, so, so the first, first version of the vision was too restricted. The second version of the vision was too complicated. Uh, and what we've come up with now, I hope, is something which is not limited, like, uh, like the first version, but has lots of room for expansion. Uh, and is much easier to understand. I mean, where's the ambiguity about all electronic products and services? Um, uh, and they're based on ARM technology, and the technology is power efficient, 
uh, and it's about making the world a better place. So hopefully that's uh, a little bit easier to understand. But anyway, wanted to step through the evolution of uh, the vision and simply for illustrating the point that you know, a vision isn't something which is necessarily um, static and there uh, for, for all time. It does need to evolve and it does need to change. The world changes and the business changes with them. So now let's just quick chat about realizing the vision because visions are all very well and good, but you know, in business, um, things actually need to be realized. And in fact, it's all about the execution. So there's a big cliche about inspiration and perspiration, but the reality of most cliches is that they're based on truth. Uh, and the reality, um, certainly in our case, is a little bit of inspiration and lots and lots of hard work. Um, the fact that uh, the team is crucial is uh, also a little bit of a cliche, but we can't all be Isaac Newton. Uh, you know, I said he was a bright chap, and uh, certainly um, you know, most of us are not blessed with that sort of intellect. Uh, and therefore, to achieve good things, uh, you need more than one individual. You need multidisciplined, multi-talented teams. Uh, but those teams need to remain motivated, uh, and they need to cope with multi-year journeys uh, to achieve a vision, uh, and they need to cope with major setbacks on the way. And some of those setbacks will be in the form of politics. You know, status quo is there for a reason. Um, the uh, competition which comes from the status quo, people are kind of reluctant to change. Uh, and there are others who are trying to change the status quo as well, but not in the way that you want to change it. So there'll be competition. Uh, and leadership of this is, uh, is, is vital. So it's all about execution, really. Um, now, the next bit is, um, this is uh, an under disclaimer rules. Um, this is not management guru, this is me. Um, so, you know, philosophies and uh, principles to achieve that execution. Uh, in business, there is never a right answer. Um, uh, and there's always a trade-off, and there's always got to be some kind of a balance. Uh, I generally find that if I can explain it to um, my, my grandmother's no longer with us, but uh, my grandmother, in inverted commas, uh, as in common sense, then, uh, then probably that's a good way of, of doing it. Uh, teamwork is absolutely important. Um, the, the more you try and do in, in business, the more you realize how inadequate you are as an individual uh, and how important it is to have people around you who are very capable uh, individuals. Uh, another important uh, point is pace. And I mean pace, not haste. I mean, this is a balance between doing things quickly um, and um, getting them right. Uh, and so it's doing things at an appropriate pace. And some things it's necessary to take a long time over and move quite slowly. And sometimes uh, the pace has to be much, much faster. And it's finding the appropriate pace for the situation and the thing that you're actually trying to do. Uh, and then I would say that for successful execution, we also need to have respect for, um, for individuals. Uh, and in the commercial world, for doing things, uh, unfortunately, coming second doesn't really count. Um, it's the winning. Uh, and in order to do that, um, you have to remember that things actually get done by, having, by doing them, by not talking about them, but by getting on and doing them. And sometimes it's necessary not to, to do without having all the information around you and to remember that 90% you know, right is a heck of a lot better than 100% never. Um, as with the examples we saw on the dedicated people working towards their visions, things always take a lot longer than you expect. Um, but you know, they will take forever if you don't start. Uh, and again, looking back to the inspiration of some of, those, uh, some of those examples that I showed a few moments ago, Champions really don't take no for an answer. There's a heck of a lot of no in the execution. And if you want to succeed in the execution, you don't take no for an answer. Uh, and um, then always trying. I suppose what, what this is saying is if you don't try, you'll never succeed. But failing to apply at all guarantees that you're going to fail. So, um, so please start. 
Um, and then leadership was important, and obviously leadership, there are all sorts of cliches about leadership, um, but it really is about, about convincing people that um, what, what you're trying to do is the right thing. Um, the behavior of the leader really does depend on the situation, uh, and the leader really needs to be a genuine in, in individual. Uh, and again, those examples that, uh, that I showed, I think, that have that really managed to achieve things over, over multi-years were, were genuine individuals. In business today, though, um, the management's important as well, all the boring bits, um, you know, as opposed to the uh, charismatic bits, are, are actually necessary in, uh, in, a, in a business organization today. And leading a business today is about synthesizing all of that uh, and putting it together. It's about being prepared to, to personalize the business a bit uh, and having the sort of attributes that we talk about on the bottom of the slide there. Quick change to finish. Just go, let's go beyond the vision for a moment. This man's most famous speech was a speech about dreams, uh, not visions. He had a dream. Um, that's how the speech is generally uh, remembered now as the dream speech in 1963, I believe. Around that time, there were all sorts of other people dreaming as well. Um, the 60s was a, a time of a lot of this sort of thing, um, where people dreamt about world peace. But uh, when we go on a few years and think about you know, the reality of uh, world peace, this is peaceful reality. This is Green and Common in the 70s. Uh, and um, that was all, all a bit different. So what am I saying here? I'm saying that Dreams are actually very important in vision. Uh, a dream is a vision, but it hasn't got the execution yet. Um, <clears throat> vision has to start from somewhere, and it generally starts from a dream. And a dream will also help to stretch the vision so that when we've achieved the vision, we can dream beyond uh, where we've got to uh, and come up with a vision that, uh, that is really stretching. So do we think that this vision for ARM, as an example, will ever be realized? Will we get to a world where all electronic products and services are based on ARM's energy-efficient technology making life better? Well, Shai asked me to talk a little bit about where we are now and some of the barriers. Um, this is our biggest barrier at the moment. Uh, Socking Grip, big semiconductor company, with nearly 100,000 employees, um, a load more, 80 times more revenue than ARM, and actually a pretty healthy operating margin, uh, and some outstandingly good technology. Um, so, you know, huge resource there, uh, and here's us. <laughs> yeah, a small company that dares to battle with Intel. Well, actually, go back to our business model uh, and think about the, the, the royalty model and the tax and the uh, half a billion dollars of revenue, and Intel's about 80 times as big. Uh, well, now actually, there's approximately the same amount of ARM chip revenue in the world per annum as there is Intel microprocessor revenue uh, per annum. Uh, and so it is actually much more of a level playing field. So I think it is a, a reasonable uh, battle. And um, the fact is that if we're going to achieve what, uh, what we want to achieve, uh, with that vision, then um, there's no question uh, about it. We absolutely have to do battle with this uh, great big barrier. Um, how does the vision help? Well, that constant vision remains in view. Uh, for me and for the management team and others at ARM, then exactly how we're going to get around that barrier, exactly the detail of how we're going to, to walk up that slope, it's hard to see from here, and I honestly can't tell you. Uh, how we're going to do it. But let's keep that constant vision in view, uh, and that will work. Uh, it does provide inspiration, which is, if you like, the dream. It does uh, provide the resolve to the, to the leadership, which, if you like, drives the execution. And it does provide motivation, which is about providing uh, a alignment in the team. So for big visions, they're about dreams, execution, and alignment, and that's it. Thank you, Laura. I think that there's no magic answer, and you're talking about a specific, uh, specific example there with 
you know, a specific answer. You know, each, each large semiconductor company who licensed ARM early on um, was licensing ARM for an individual specific reason. Uh, as it happened, um, when TI licensed uh, a microprocessor from ARM, I was actually at TI and saw it from the other side. Uh, and uh, you know, at, at TI, we were very, very keen to win the business with Nokia, but simply, simply didn't have a, a microprocessor that would do the job. Uh, and uh, you know, so either we had to invent another microprocessor, which TI had invented lots of microprocessors by then. And actually, we had a very successful 4-bit uh, microprocessor, very successful 16-bit microprocessor, but unfortunately before the rest of the world realized that they needed 16-bit microprocessors. So in business terms, it wasn't that successful, even though it was a very nice microprocessor. Um, and we'd lost confidence, really, uh, at, at TI in, in um, going for it and building another microprocessor. So in a way, it was, it was shopping around and uh, the ARM processor had the right characteristics for sitting alongside uh, a TI DSP to target the Nokia application. And really, it was as simple as that, um, plus a few commercial terms and some very good selling from the ARM team at the time uh, to, uh, to position their microprocessor so that it would satisfy TI's uh, requirements. Um, you could go and look at you know other early licensees of ARM, and you know why did they uh, need to uh, need to license ARM? And you know some of it was was very much uh, customer driven. You know, Sharp was ARM's uh, ARM's third licensee, and you know, it was the only answer for them to uh, to build the Newton product that they wanted to build because ARM was already designed into the Newton product. Uh, and I could go on, and until about 1997, then virtually every <laughs> Um, every semiconductor company that licensed from ARM, there was a very, very unique story uh, behind that license. Um, when you actually look at it, then uh, you know, people, people who would want to um, acquire ARM, uh, you, know, you have to look at why they would want to acquire ARM. Uh, and uh, there's much, much cheaper ways of using the ARM technology than buying the business. Um, it's not like that man with the razor advert, you know. Uh, you, can, you can license an ARM uh, for a few million dollars, uh, and you can build as many ARM chips as you like for a, a relatively small um, share of your revenue. Why on earth would you want to spend billions of dollars on buying the whole business. Uh, probably the only reason is if you wanted to destroy the business for um, competitive purposes. This would be a, a huge destruction of, uh, of value, um, probably even for some of the biggest companies around who also tend to be public companies and therefore beholden to their shareholders who kind of don't really like that level of value destruction. Um, but this is an interesting balance. Uh, you then have to take into account the interests of all the other, other players as well and um, what sort of actions they might take in the event of some form of um, competitive uh, takeover like that. But I think the main, the main defense lies in the business model. Well, one of the answers is that at the end of the day, we're, we're not completely tied to silicon technology as it exists today. Um, you know, part of our business is about deploying our microprocessor on bulk CMOS silicon, which is where all the volume is today. Um, part of it is keeping abreast of the way in which the underlying technology is evolving and making sure that our designs uh, can be implemented on alternative technologies. Now, as far as um, looking beyond, um, beyond silicon into different types of computing, uh, then absolutely ARM, uh, ARM is, is 
you know, more tied to the traditional type of computing that, that we've seen that's been implemented on silicon, and then actually from a computer architecture point of view has been implemented in mainframes for, for years. So um, there's actually not a lot of rocket science in, in, in that, and if a complete change of the computing way in which uh, functions are, are, are performed uh, takes place, then, uh, then ARM is certainly as vulnerable as everybody else, and there's no, uh, no special tools at ARM uh, to, to deal with that sort of um, left field technology threat. Uh, than you'd find in any other company. We spend a certain amount of time researching it and looking out for it, and um, in, in the business world, even in technology where things seem to move incredibly fast, they don't move incredibly fast, and there's a lot of inertia associated with the status quo. So I, I think it's, a, it's certainly a valid risk, one that we're obviously aware of all the time, but, um, but not one that I'm losing sleep over right now. Well, they're coming out today as we speak, and um, China has had several attempts at a uh, national microprocessor in our space. Uh, and really, it's been a story of using the standard argument um, and using the business model argument together to explain to companies in China that they can be very independent and Chinese and make a lot more progress on selling their technology and utilizing the hundreds of thousands of engineers that are coming out of Chinese universities every year on, on building on top of ARM's standard. That also helps the Chinese companies sell their products to companies elsewhere in the world who already utilize the standard. And with the business model we have, they can benefit from ARM rather than compete with ARM. I think it's a sort of uh, natural human condition uh, not to like change. It's nothing to do with Cambridge. Um, so, so that happens all over, and good news because arms operations happen all over as well. Uh, and I, I think it's a matter of just chipping away. You know, one of the one of the things I sought to bring out in the non-business examples was the sheer length of time it takes uh, for. Um, for people to achieve significant and lasting change. Uh, and I said that for big companies with you know, big brands that we all recognize, the Procter and Gambles and the Coca-Colas of this world and so on, you know, they've been at it for decades. Uh, and so actually it's not necessary to have people change quickly. Um, and people are naturally reluctant to change all over. Your competitors are all facing the same issues about people being reluctant to change. Um, I think if you can have a reasonably exciting vision uh, that you can get people to, to therefore buy into, then they are prepared to help change the status quo over time. Um, but I don't think it's necessary to change overnight. We, we have that, that debate in ARM from time to time. It, it's normally a, a short debate um, because you know, our livelihood depends on enabling um, semiconductor companies to, to build chips with our technology at the moment. If we set about building them ourselves, we'd be competing with those people who are paying us money. Um, in order to, uh, to move to that level of building real things rather than enabling many, then um, we'd also need to understand our customers' customers a lot better. We'd have to take a lot more risk. Uh, and so the whole point about the ARM business model is to do something which is quite generic uh, and therefore operates at a much lower level of risk than the next stage down, down the value chain. Uh, in return, then you know, we don't make as much money per chip that gets sold, um, but it costs us a lot less, uh, and we, we achieve it with a lot less risk. Uh, and it's, it's there in, in the numbers. So you know, 
we're achieving $25 billion worth of silicon uh, per annum, and we're doing that with 1,700 people, and we're just taking a small piece of the $25 billion, and we're doing it with a lot less risk. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there is no answer, and the team that we build uh, changes all the time. Um, since I've been CEO, the management team at Arm has, has gradually evolved, and we've acquired new skills to compete with new threats. Um, so, you know, that's, to me, common sense. The sorts of people that we're looking for are people who won't give up and who won't take no for an answer. Uh, and you know that's the same whether it's in business or whether it's in sport or whether it's in any endeavor if you're going to win there will always be setbacks and you're looking for people with that sort of stubborn streak that uh, that, that doesn't take no for an answer in in technology of course uh, there are people always have bright ideas a long way before the market is, uh, is ready for them uh, and a lot of resources wasted on uh, trying to develop those ideas and take them to market before the market is, is really ready. So again, I don't think there's a, there's a single magic answer to this one. Uh, it's, it's a matter of only applying as much resource as you absolutely need early on. Uh, and being quite ruthless about, uh, about holding, holding that resource back till the market's ready. It's about being quite ruthless in not pursuing everything and about prioritizing. You know, we would have a product portfolio of about 200 different microprocessors today if, uh, if we were a bit indisciplined about it. Uh, we wouldn't have made a bean out of all those microprocessors and we would have spent much more developing the 200 portfolio than we would have out of the sort of 25 to 30 portfolio that, that, that we have. So I think it's just discipline and um, being fairly hard. <laughs>